Were you ever a soldier, a rifle or machine gun holder? Could you strip a brain and name its parts? Were you trained in the battlefield's dark arts? Were you ever in some trench line made aware by the flickering falling light of a parachute flare and the windrush of the shot that parts your hair, of the edge of madness, darkness and despair? And if you do not know and were not there, then how dare you, a laptop bombardier, presume to join the devil's chorus for another futile sacrificial war? I think armed conflict is the most extreme of human activities. It's being a human being at the at the outer edge, and it 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 touches a raw nerve, uh, and you need you need soothing. It's 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 medical, it's balm for the for the soul. Homestage's newest online discussion group, Frontline Poets, uses poetry to address the aftermath of serving in conflict. Today, I'm here with Martin Bell, a ex-serviceman. Uh, war correspondent for the BBC of over 30 years. Um, he's worked with several military charities and he is also a poet. We're here to discuss how poetry can be used to address the suffering and anguish that people experience in connection to war. Martin, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Um, so you've experienced war, you've witnessed the effects that it has on those who've served and their families. Um, and obviously you've also found the benefit that poetry has in addressing those struggles. And I think it'd be good to start at the very beginning. Um, and you were called for national service. How did you feel about that when you were called? I knew I had to do the national service. Two years, hard labour, so to speak. What I didn't understand was about to end. And if I deferred it, I wouldn't have had to do it. But in some ways, although it was tough and hard and I was away from my family for the first time in my life, I look back on it with a degree of affection because I learned more in two years as a soldier than I did in three years in one of the fancier colleges at Cambridge. You learn how to get on with people. You learn what matters and, and what doesn't. You learn the uses of dark humour. Yes. So how would you describe the experience in general? Do you, I mean, you say you sort of look back kind of fondly, I suppose. There are things you don't enjoy doing, but you enjoy having done. For me, being a soldier was one, and being a member of parliament was the other. It introduced me to the real world. I was on active service. Now, active service means somebody out there might, might want to kill you. We had at the time 35,000 troops trying and failing to put down the Aoka rebellion in, uh, in Cyprus. And I was part of the colonial jackboot, if you like. And one thing it taught me that stayed with me is that the force hardly ever, the use of force hardly ever attains the objective set for it. Mm. What was the, the general feeling of everyone who was there? Was, was there a lot of fear? I don't remember feeling much fear. I think I only heard one shot fired in anger, as they say, in all of my, my, my two years. I felt a lot of boredom. And like all soldiers, certainly the conscripts, we were, we were counting the, the days to do. You know you had a certain amount of days to pass and you'd be out of there. And I've never looked forward to anything so much in my life as to that, that demob. Mm. Are there any particular, particular highs or lows of the experience that have really stuck with you to this day? I was part of a coordinate search operation in which seemed, it seemed to me even then that we were... We had no way of winning these people over, uh, the, the Cypriots, by searching them endlessly, exposing them to roadblocks, searching their houses. I thought if some foreign army had come to my hometown in Suffolk and done that, I would have turned against them. Uh, it was a, it was a, it was, a, it was a sort of end of empire feeling. It's how things were, and the battalion I served in was an end of empire battalion. It was the last troops out of Jerusalem in 1948. I actually knew some of them. We had a, a platoon sergeant who had actually deserted from the British Army in Jerusalem in 1948, joined the Haganah, the Jewish fighters, and fought against the Arabs. Married an Israeli uh, uh, girl, after five years, didn't like it, came back to Colchester, was court-martialed, given uh, 12 months hard labour 
and he did about eight of them. Then he rejoined the army, and by the time I knew him, he was a valued platoon sergeant, one of the finest soldiers I ever met. Mm. And, I mean, your experience of service, I mean, you've said that it was a really young time to be leaving home, um, and that there were difficulties. Was this a common experience? Do you think other people found it easier or harder doing what they had to do? For the regulars, it's what they signed on for. They had only themselves to blame. Uh, but the National Service, and some of them had actually got married just before coming out. Mm. For, for others, it meant the end of relationship with their girlfriends. And not all of them were very good with words, so I helped them a lot. And I, mm. I wrote that I, 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 they showed me, the, they're called Dear John Letters. And I helped them write very pained replies to their Dear John Letters. So there was a lot of private misery going on. Yeah. There were, I don't know how many... Uh, suicides among conscripts, it was something like two million young men mm. were forced to do service after the end of the Second World War. There was a, quite a high rate of uh, suicide. And so you say private misery, it was often kept under wraps, people didn't talk about it. You didn't want to appear to your mates to be too miserable, because one thing that the army taught me was togetherness, bonding, uh, They've they've got a they've got a they've got a term for it the, 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 the buddy buddy spirit, so you wanted to keep everybody's chipper up and uh, and and no you didn't uh, the misery was basically quiet, and although you started off as a private soldier you had no privacy whatever, you were sharing a tent with uh, five others, and the, actually the living conditions were so dreadful that eventually it came to be raised in the House of Commons. And two weeks before we left Cyprus, suddenly the tent was equipped with a, a bedside lamp and an armchair. <laughs> and if only these, that comes sooner. these were announced to the Commons by the Minister for the Armed Forces, a certain John Profumo, who became famous for other things later. But I, I had no idea I was going to end up in the House of Commons, no idea at all. I wore a sash, mounted the guard, and joined the lads in drinking hard, but was only playing a part. For beneath the battle dress, Half smart, there beat a civilian heart. The death and glory charge was not for me. I loitered in the bunker, brewed the tea, and thought that's what they taught me fieldcraft for, in order to avoid this bloody war. We column dodgers, unimpressed with dulce et decorum est, don't wish to be inscribed in red in Roll of Honour or Archive, but reason that, being alive, beats the alternative of being dead by more than a short head. The Major General cut himself while shaving and cursed the Brigadier who madly raving, then cast the most chastising and infernal aspersions on the morals of the Colonel, who passed them to the Major and he, wrapped in the darkest thoughts, conveyed them to the Captain, who rocketed the subalterns who rose to loose all hell among the NCOs, and they with mad acerbity then picked on last long last Bakshi Private, me. They asked if ever I'd been shot. I said that once I was. They wondered, did it hurt a lot? I answered, not so much because wounds of the body, not the mind, leave only marks and scars behind. But in the lies and larcenies of war, the hurt and pain and grief are so much more. I was felled by the Serbs and robbed by the French, each playing to their strengths, some said. So I think as I sit on the garden bench, how lucky not to be dead. Well, I mean, it's it's really fascinating to hear about the time that you spent in service yourself. And obviously, I mean, you're you're most well known for being a war correspondent yeah. for 30 years for the BBC. Um, and that in itself presents its own its own um, difficulties and uh, challenges. I mean, how did you feel about going to those war zones that you did? I think it was an easier time. The worst thing, I started in Vietnam, I did two Arab-Israeli wars, Central American wars, uh, Gulf War One, quite a lot of wars in Africa, which were dangerous. But the greatest risk you faced was being caught in the crossfire, not being targeted. So I did this for more than 30 years, and you know, I only ever got wounded once, so I was very lucky. But I had a lot of colleagues and good friends who did not survive. There were more journalists killed in the five years of the Balkan, six years really, of the Balkan Wars than in the ten years of uh, Vietnam. 
And when I started going to Croatia in 92, 91, I went to Croatia in 91, Bosnia in 92, we had no, we had no uh, uh, protection whatever, no steel helmets, no flak jackets, no armoured vehicles. I was once driving into Sarajevo across the airport runway, which was the only way in, in June 92. And I was driving and the driver's door was hit by sniper fire. But it never actually penetrated the door. I was driving an old Vauxhall Carlton. So I wrote, wrote to Vauxhall afterwards and thanked them for making a tank without knowing it. Peace was my summer, war my winter, from which, as witness and reporter, I keep a souvenir, the splinter of an exploded mortar. Along the front lines, I would walk on paths where my wise men feared to go and learn that those who know don't talk and those who talk don't know. Long in advance of 9-11, I knew the zones of conflict well and being baptised by shot and shell, I hoped to earn my slot in heaven for I'd done my time in hell. In front lines where the mortars shatter, I wrote as witness and reporter, everyone's lying but it doesn't matter because no one's listening either. So one of your poems that you have read is uh, Mount Igman, 1993, and it has this perspective of being a war reporter. Um, and it sort of, I mean, it, it made me think about how you've, throughout all of your experiences from witnessing war, from actually serving, um, and also working with all of the military charities that you have, mm. you've collected um, some lots of experiences of people who have served. And I wondered, how you think people manage to cope after serving, um, after they've been in conflict, and also just returning to civilian life, because that can be really challenging. Some cope better than others. I think the British Army understands what used to be called shell shock, we now call PTSD, much better than it used to. Certainly when I was serving, it would have been a sign of, of weakness that you, that you sought to conceal. Uh, it's different now. I mean, the, the, the soldiers coming out of Iraq and Afghanistan were both given a soft landing in one of the Soviet bases in Cyprus, where, the, where they, they not only had very convivial evenings, but they were lectured by the chaplains and others that while they were away, the whole uh, uh, centre of gravity of their marriages, those who married, has changed because the wife has been back there for six months uh, running the family. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's very difficult, um, it's very difficult for them. Um, I, I, you don't know if you've got PTSD yourself. I think I always denied it, but denial may be one of the symptoms, in fact. Um, so I, I may have it, I don't know. I don't have, I have, don't have bad dreams, don't have flashbacks. But if you're not human, if you're not affected by it, it's going to change. It's going to, you know, you, you, you learn what not to take for granted. And so, I, you know, I've been very lucky to come through. Absolutely. Um, and also touching on, on that poem, there are these beautiful lines. Those who know don't talk and those who talk don't know. And to me, it reminded me of um, attitudes within the armed forces often, as, as we've mentioned about um, self-reliance and not wanting or not feeling actually able to talk about these difficulties um, and I wonder if you would agree that poetry often opens up that space for people to start discussing those things that often are concealed yeah. and not spoken about these really difficult experiences yeah. that can finally be shared. I think so I find I found poetry was a very good way to, it, it's 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 encapsulating emotion um, expressing it, and I only started merely to write most of it uh, late in life. That line about those who not know don't talk, that comes from, I was for a long time the president of the Japanese Labour Camp Survivors Association. The Suffolk Regiment lost two battalions at Singapore. These men were then, those who survived, were subject to the most extreme hardship for three and a half years. And one thing we found about all of them, they were very old men by the time I get to know them, they wouldn't say a word about what had happened to them. Apparently they were ordered not to by the Southeast Asia Command because the, the narrative in August 90, 1945 was one of victory and they just endured three and a half years of defeat, one of the greatest defeats in the history of the British Army. So they never, they, they didn't talk. It was all, 
it was all bottled up inside. Mm. And you can't help but think that just it makes the problem worse if they're not if they don't feel able to talk about these issues. Yeah, I mean, people people find various refuges. Um, one of them, of course, is uh, is alcohol. When I was serving, I, I didn't drink much more than orange juice till they made me a sergeant, put a put a three stripes on my arm. Then I had to join some heavy drinking in the sergeant's mess. I got the, the first and worst hangover of my life. But I know a lot of them deal with it like that. Some some by, by talking to each other. But I think the stigma has been removed. It, it, it is not stigmatised anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, this brings me to my the main, the crux of this, which is... You know, as we've seen the poetry that you shared, how valuable it can be. I mean, you said you started writing later in life. When when did it begin for you? I this I, I had a book of poems published about 2012, or maybe 2010. I had so I'd, I'd left the House of Commons. I'd had a bit of time on my hands, and I was uh, I was sort of wandering the world. I lectured on cruise ships, and I I sat in the the scene of the Hiroshima explosion in Japan. The Hiroshima Peace Park, and I thought, and I, I put my thoughts into into words. So, so did you write at all when you were um, serving at the young age of eighteen? I wrote the one poem for the regimental poem, magazine, yeah. and and, uh, and nothing else. And I never, but I've, I've it's in the family. My father wrote a, a book of love poems, which were kept from us as children because they were written to somebody other than our mother a lady who died in a very early road accident. And my grandfather, who was the news editor of The Observer, published a lovely volume of light verse called Afterthought. So it's, it's in the family. And what was the, the general um, attitude among service people to you writing just this one poem that went in that magazine? Well, it, it was understood. It was a way of being irreverent about the officers which if you'd expressed it in other, any other way, you'd have been put on a charge or a fizzer. Yeah. But certain, because I actually, I put the entire magazine out, they were, they were quite grateful. And I was allowed a latitude as a private soldier in writing, though I've never had it in any other way. The regimental sergeant made a, major knew I was troubled and he'd have loved, loved to have had me. There's a picture of him in this book. <laughs> and um, what, what does... Uh, so many people feel sort of almost reluctant to call themselves poets or to try writing poetry. What What is poetry to you and what does it do for you? To me, poetry is a way of expressing emotion. I don't call mine poetry because you can understand it, every single thing. And I love the, I love the, the, the easy forms, the, the, the limerick, the, the, the clericue. One of my favourite uh, clericues I wrote about... Uh, Werner von Braun, you know, the, the great rocket, German rocket guy. Dr. Werner von Braun earned the plaudits and thanks of both Nazis and the Yanks for rockets that went up and then came down. So um, do you think that, like, if people um, found it more accessible in a way, I, sometimes people think poetry can be really hard to grasp and understand, mm. making it accessible and that is a way to get people in and, and enjoy it? It has to be accessible or it's completely useless. That's why I like the limericks, the clericues, even a ballade, which is a very difficult verse form, comes from the medieval French. A sonnet, if you, I mean, there, there's, the charm is in the, in the, in the, in the uh, restrictions on it. It's got to be just like that and, and no other. But uh, blank verse, the modern verse, I, I've got no time for. I mostly don't understand a word of it. This is not my poem, it was given to me by an old soldier of the Australian Army who was very badly wounded in Vietnam in about 1972, hoisted out, slung, his stretcher slung under a helicopter going, and he suffered, he suffered very badly from PTSD and he knew it. And he wrote this, The man I am and was before is strange to me and him. I find it hard to come to terms, the feelings from within. One soldier out of many ex experienced this, you know, the struggling with their own identity after what they've been doing and um, feelings that they're concealing, um, which we've mm. talked about. Um, and I find it interesting that they've turned to poetry, this person as well, and it, it there is this historic tradition of war poetry that I think is um, 
really valuable. And poetry has always been, it been relevant to war. I mean, why do you think that is? Why there's always been this connection between, between war and conflict and writing poetry? I think armed conflict is the most extreme of human activities. It's being a human being at the, at the outer edge mm. and it, 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 it touches a raw nerve uh, and you need, you need soothing. It's, it's, it's medical, it's balm for the, for the soul. There's a long history of it. I mean, the, the, the soldiers I've been to war with have tended to be very, very, uh, very keen on their Kipling, for instance. And, and, and their Shakespeare, but, but partly Kipling, because he was the soldier's poet in the sense he, under, he was never a soldier. But of course, he lost his son John very early in the Great War. Uh, yeah, they, I've, I've heard that they, before you go to battle with the British Army, the commanding officer will very often give an ins, inspirational speech. There's, there'll usually be a bit of poetry in there, and it's commonly, commonly Kipling, yeah. Yeah. And there's obviously two big names, Siegfried Sassoon and Wilfred Owen. Two of your poems are yeah. about them. Um, and you describe the writing of Anthem for Doomed Youth as an edge of mortality quest for peace and truth. Yeah. And I, you know, I wonder, is, can that be the parallel to poetry? You know, can poetry offer that peace and an expression of truth? Poetry is, is, is truthful. It's a truthful expression of emotion. Uh, you know, war makes you think, and I found it natural. I actually, I and then I do certainly remember the 1973 war between Israel and its Arab neighbors. Neighbors, I actually took with me a couple, a copy of. I still got a dog-eared copy of Wilfred Owen's verse, and I found it. I could obviously sort of read it on the battlefield, but I, back in the hotel room, I would read them in the evening and think, as it has everything changed that much? Only the only the weaponry, but not the not the feelings, not the not the fear, not the will to survive. Poetry does all these things. They wrote the immortal anthem for doomed youth, both in Craig Lockhart, shell shocked and war blighted, in which two minds became one mind, not the blind leading the blind, but the far sighted the far sighted, on an edge of mortality quest for peace and truth. One thing that I wanted to ask you was that if there are people watching this who are uh, connected to the armed forces um, but haven't tried their hand at poetry, do you have any pieces of advice for them how to get started or, you know, how to approach poetry? I think I recommend it. You don't know if you can do it until you've tried. Um, give, it, give it a go. Try to write something that's quite, that's quite simple. And you all have role, you know, whose poetry do you like? Um, mine was very, very simple. It, it's, uh, it was obviously Kipling, uh, Chesterton, uh, the Romantic poets, uh, and uh, and Wilfred Owen. The Treaty of Westphalia was partly to blame into Alia for the new nation states and their subsequent fates of war and division and failure, which is historically correct. Actually, I did want to ask. So, you were saying about um, you know find your favourite poets. Yes. If there are people who haven't read poetry before and don't read poetry, do you think that they can still access it, that they can still have a go at writing? I think you can do a lot worse than pick up one of the regular anthologies with all, with all the classics in them, see what appeals. And then, you know, I'm not asking them to imitate, but try writing in that, in that, in that style. I found, I found that it, I found it, it worked for me. I write a... I write a poem every day now, every single day. Uh, a lot of them uh, political, um, but some of them still military. It's been absolutely fant fantastic chatting with you, Martin. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, it's been eye-opening, but also um, just really interesting. I'm sorry I forgot so many of my poems. I had them all by heart. Sorry <laughs> at all. Thank you for tuning in. I hope that you've enjoyed this, where we've been discovering Martin's own experiences of serving and reporting and writing about these experiences. If you or anyone you know is connected to the armed forces and would like to discover the benefits of poetry, you can sign up to our Frontline Poets discussion group, where we will use poetry to address time served in conflict and the suffering and anguish that comes out of these experiences. Thank you. The ground is haunted by the ghosts of soldiers long departed. 
of men who did not leave their posts but being valiant and stout-hearted were listed casualties instead, some being wounded, others dead, for reasons unimparted, and the mortal souls flew overhead of soldiers long departed.